Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may you know the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the great forgiveness that he has given you by his death on the cross, the promise of the resurrection. May it live in your hearts now and always. Amen. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you for opportunity to worship together in your house this day. We thank you, O Lord, that you have given us your forgiveness of, for our sins, even as undeserved it is, as it is. Lord, we pray that at times when we grow angry, when we grow wrathful, when, the, when our angers overcome us, that we would turn to you, seeking instead your forgiveness, seeking instead your mercy. Lord, lead us always to live in that state of grace, knowing our sins are forgiven, and one day we shall rest secure in you. This we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You know, April 15th, 2013. I imagine many of you were scrambling at the last minute, or some of you probably had your taxes done, but many of you were probably scrambling to get your taxes filed. April 15th, always that filing deadline. For the folks in Boston, Massachusetts, however, they had something else on their mind. April 15th marked the 117th Boston Marathon. Now, I imagine most of you do not know who won that Boston Marathon. Of course, it was already two years ago, so even if you follow running, you may have already forgotten this. It was Lalisa Dedisa, thankfully his name was easy, uh, from Ethiopia. But I imagine most of you probably don't remember that name either, and don't remember even that the Boston Marathon was run on that day. On that day, April 15th, 2013, it was a cool day, about 40 degrees outside. It warmed up to the mid-50s. The race was set to run. They observed a 26-second silence to remember those who had been brutally murdered in Newtown, Connecticut at Sandy Hook Elementary. And then the race began. It was about 2.50 in the afternoon, a little after 4 o'clock race time, that two explosions shook the race route. 264 people were injured. Three lives were taken. Two brothers the Sonara brothers, they planted those two bombs. Had they not been stopped, they had planned to go on to Times Square to plant two more bombs. Now, if you've been following the news, you know that April of this year, Sakar, if I'm pronouncing that right, hopefully I am, Sarnayev, was found guilty just a couple of days ago. He was sentenced to death. Now, when asked why they did this, their answer initially was that it was religiously motivated, but it was, there was a greater center than that. They were angry. They were angry at the United States and angry at the citizenry of the United States because they had sent troops into Iraq and Afghanistan. They were angry because of what they perceived was injustice. When they spoke to their mom, Zubadat Sarnayev, her words were filled with vitriol and hate. She did not believe that her sons had committed a crime, that the crime that was being committed was what was being done to them or what was being did, uh, found guilty, their one son who survived. When we hear about things like this, it makes us angry, doesn't it? When we hear about this Boston Marathon bombing and we hear about a father who has to make a decision between his son or his daughter, we get angry. We see the injustice when we hear about a shooting at Newtown, in Newtown at Sandy Hook Elementary. We grow indignant. Those are just children, innocent children, as we might imagine in our minds. When we think about Bashar al-Assad using biological weapons on his own people in Syria, we wonder how a leader can do that. When we think about Christians around the world being tortured and put to death, we get angry. We get angry. Now, at times, when we think about anger, we immediately assume that it's a bad thing. We immediately assume that anger must be because of so many bad things that happen from anger. For instance, the Sarnaya brothers. But truly, anger in and of itself is not a sin. And I think it's important we know that in and of itself is not the sin. In fact, if we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. 
Do not allow the devil to gain a foothold. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry, but do not sin. So often, though, our sin, though, unlike, unlike, uh, so often our, sin, our anger turns into sin because we lose control of it. Time and again in Proverbs, Solomon warns of the man or the woman who loses control of their anger. Time and again in Proverbs, he warns that if you, uh, the fool is the one who has a hot head. And that is where the sin comes, when we lose control. When we get angry for selfish reasons, self-centered reasons. Now let's look at anger that is not sinful. Our Gospel reading from Mark chapter 11 this morning Jesus became angry. In fact, if you go to John chapter 2, it's recorded in all four of the Gospels. It says that he had a great zeal for the temple of the Lord. His zeal was for the fact that the Lord's house was being polluted, that it was being corrupted, that it was being used inappropriately. And so Jesus grew angry. He bound together a cord and made a whip, and he drove those out of the temple who were doing things that they should not be doing. Now, Jesus' anger, though, was righteous anger, unlike our anger. He was not motivated by his own self-interest, by his own self-desire. He was not motivated by his own hurt, his own shame. He was motivated by the indignation towards the corruption of God's house, as we should be. Righteous anger comes about when we see injustice, when we see God's word being trampled on. It is okay to become angry when we see the abuses of women and children and families, it is okay to be angry at those things, but how we respond to that anger is what is important. Now, when we think about our own lives, how do we often respond to our anger? Different people respond in different ways. Some people, when they get angry, they grow, they grow aggressive. They do things to other people, violent things, things that we don't think are okay. Many of us know families who have been hurt by people who do not control their anger, who take it out in aggressive ways. The Sarnayev brothers are a good example of that aggressive that aggression that comes out. But I think more often than not, many people operate, vent their anger in passive-aggressive ways. Passive aggression is... The silent treatment. When we don't talk to someone else, a a spouse or a child, because we need to punish them so they know that they hurt us. Passive aggression comes about in the little things we do or don't do to let someone else know that they've hurt us. We don't confront the issue directly. We don't confront the person directly where aggression does, but passive aggression, it tries to get back at a person for what they've done. Have you all ever shown those signs of aggression? Those passive, aggressive behaviors? So many of us do. In fact, I think that's where we see it more often in the church. We see those passive, aggressive behaviors, ignoring the people who have not lived up to our standard, gossiping about the people who seem to need to share a little information about what someone else has done to them. We want to punish people for the hurts, the shames that they have given to us. And as we think about that, whether aggressive or passive aggressive, both behaviors are destructive to our relationships with one another and with God. It it seems fairly obvious, but so often it's not. But how often passive aggressive behaviors hurt the relationships of those we love, those silent treatments, those things that we do that they kind of whittle away at the other person. They start to build a wedge in between us and them. Those little hurts here and those little hurts there, they add up, don't they? All of us have experienced the pain of someone who is both aggressive and passive-aggressive. In sports, we might talk about aggression as a good thing, a way that a person can get out there, vent properly, but not in life. In life. It creates hurts and afflictions and pain. And so often that's what we're led toward. We vent our anger in ways that we know that we shouldn't. We lose our temper and fly off the handle. 
We say things and we do things that we know that we should not, and we look back and we regret them later. And our anger, instead of being righteous anger, turns into sinful anger. Sinful anger creates those divisions. Sinful anger drives us away from God because it leads us to ask Him what He is doing, where He is at, whether we are those who are receiving the affliction or whether those we are doing the afflicting. Why isn't He making things more fair, more balanced? Why isn't He ensuring that things are going the way I think they should go? And so we start to question God's will. We start to question where he is, how he is active in this world where murderers and criminals and terrorists are allowed to get away with such evil things. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever asked God why? I know I have. If I'm completely honest with you, which I am being, as I always am, I just need to make sure I clarify that. As if I'm completely honest here, I know that there's more than one occasion where I've been angry at God. Sinful anger has filled my heart, and I've questioned God, and I've asked Him why. And I've wanted an answer. Sometimes I hear Paul's words, my grace is sufficient for you, the answer God gave to him. And I think, Lord, if your grace is sufficient, why do I keep asking why? I know I'm not alone in this. And instead of God answering that why question, he points us to his greater promise. I don't know if you all paid close attention to our responsive psalm from Psalm 103 this morning. But in that text is this beautiful verse that I think we read right over. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God divide our sin from us. It's right near the end of the reading there. So far does God divide our sin from us. God in His wrath and His anger, which is righteous because we have failed time and again. We've allowed sinful anger and questions to fill our hearts and lives. Instead of pouring it out on us, though, He poured it out on His Son, Jesus. He poured out His wrath and His anger on Christ so that we instead would know forgiveness, so that we instead would know hope and promise so that we instead would know that we are the children of God. And that although we have questions of why in this world, although our hearts flare with anger and indignation, He gives us the promise of peace. Peace with Him. Yes, on this side of eternity, those pains from the hurts, they will last. Oh, He fills our hearts in. He fills in those holes, but we know that the pain stays. He gives us a promise, though, that one day we'll be with Him where there is neither pain nor hurt, neither sadness nor tears. The way that we answer anger and wrath is with love and with mercy. Many of you probably remember in 2006 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there was an Amish community. Actually, if you go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, you'll find that there are many Amish communities there a man by the name of Charles Roberts or Charlie Roberts came into that community and he shot 10 young ladies who were in school, Amish girls who were learning. You can imagine how the Amish community must have felt. The fear, the pain, the hurt. The parents of these girls wondering what it would have been like to walk them down the aisle. What kind of family would they have developed and grown into together? They would never see that. They would never know that. But their response was not anger. Their response was not one of rage and demanding justice. Always amazing to me, their response was one of forgiveness. As their Father in Heaven forgave them, they forgave. And it's so hard for us when we've been hurt to forgive. But that is what the calling of a Christian. That is the calling of God's Word. To not respond to hate, to pain, to anger in the, with revenge, with what our sinful nature leads to, but with love. In Romans chapter 12, 
over and over again, Paul shows us how we are to respond to one another. Do not seek vengeance, for vengeance is the Lord's. But seek love and mercy. Show love and mercy. That is the calling of the Christian. And God, He does promise. He promises that in that love and mercy, that He will bring peace. Not the peace of the world, the short-lived peace, if we wouldn't even call it that, of revenge, where we feel that sudden high, but the peace that lasts. The peace that is beyond all understanding. That is what God gives to us. And I know, I know it's hard to forgive. Many of you have experienced pains and hurts that have infuriated you, that have caused you to lose your temper even days, weeks, years later. The Lord says, bring it to Him. Cast your burdens onto Jesus, for He cares for you. Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus came to show us love. We as Christians are called to share that love, to show that love, to show forgiveness and mercy when the world would not. On our own, we cannot do it. Only by the power of the Spirit, only by the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and lives can we bring those things to Him and we will know that peace. Please pray with me. Most gracious Lord, we know that in this life there are many hurts and pains. There are people who have harmed us and so often our, our, we want to respond in anger. We want our revenge. We want to respond and, and lash out. We even demand of you at times. We question you and we say, why? Lord, we know though that this is sinful anger. That this is sinful wrath. Lead us instead to bring that anger that frustration, that shame, that disappointment, that hurt to You. Lead us instead to bring it to You by the power of Your Spirit, knowing that You are in control of all things, knowing that You are gracious and merciful, that You will work all things to the good of those who love You and are called according to Your purpose. Lord, forgive us for those times. Help us also to share that forgiveness to share that mercy, to reflect that love that you have shown to us. Lord, lead us by our, your word and your spirit that we may know your peace. And may your peace that is beyond all understanding fill our hearts and our minds. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.